going to increase your ability to borrow more in the future. But even if you don't pay it back, you don't have to. What do you mean you don't have to pay it back? So in a life insurance policy, you have two components. You have the death benefit, and then you have the cash value. The cash value is what's growing by the amount of what you're putting into it. Mm -hmm. The death benefit is the initial death benefit that comes with the life insurance policy. So if I buy me a life insurance policy and I'm paying a premium of $1,000 a month, my death benefit right away is like $500,000, for example. So if I don't pay that cash value policy back and I borrowed against it, it's going to be subtracted from my death benefit when I die. And my death benefit is always more than the cash value. So if I got a $500,000 death benefit and I borrow $30,000 when I die, my heirs are going to get the $500,000 minus the $30,000 plus the interest. So I might they might still end up with like $450,000. But you enjoyed the money and leveraged it while you were living. How many of y'all are with me so far in understanding what I'm saying? Me. So you're going to borrow against it to leverage it. And if you run into some tough times and don't pay it back, there is unstructured, which means nobody is chasing you. You don't need a credit check to, to get your own money. You don't have to wait until you're 59 and a half to get your own money. You don't have to pay it back because there's no time limit on when to pay it back because they know they're going to get the money back when you die from the death benefit anyway. So you have literally no strict rules that you have to follow. The only reason why, again, I like to pay it back because I do want to keep increasing my ability as it grows to borrow for bigger projects in the future. All right. Should I give y'all another visual, visual aid? So let me give y'all a visual aid on how this works. All right. Let me pull this up. So here's another visual aid. Let me give you two visual aids. So the first visual aid, I'm going to talk to y'all about how a wealth creator Instead of like being a saver and saving, 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 and then paying cash, I'm going to tell you how the difference on how a wealth creator and a rich person does it so you can see how, how they keep their money while you make more money. And it seems like that you're living paycheck to paycheck. The more money you make, the more, it seems like you're the same level of broke. So how did you change that? All right. So let me show you. So let's just say you're contributing $20,000 a year earning you 8%. And we're going to do that for 30 years. Now, the saver, what they're going to do is they're going to save, save, save. They're the red. They're going to save, save, save. And then the fifth year, they're going to pay cash. And now they got to refill that money and save, save, save. And then they're going to pay cash. Then they're going to save, save, save. And then they're going to pay cash. This is literally what a saver does. This is why most people don't retire with more than $500,000. So this person, by following that strategy, even though they were making 8%, they end up with only $332,910 30 years later. And that's how most Americans do. The wealth creator, they're not going to follow the system where they're putting all of their money into a 401k. They're not putting all of their money into the bank. They're actually funding these type of Roths or cash value policies. And what they're going to do is they're going to grow their money. And just like the wealth creator, when it's time to buy something, they're going to borrow against themselves and pay it back. So notice their money never goes backwards. They never stop the forward momentum of their money. So they spent the same thing. They made the same thing. They saved the same thing. They earned the same interest rate. But the difference is, is that the wealth creator ends up with $2,466,917, where the saver only ends up with 332910 that's a difference of $2,134,008 simply by restructuring what they're already doing. And by the way, that $2,466,000 is tax-free versus the $332,000 is taxable. So which one would you rather be? $2.5 million or $330,000 where you got to pay taxes? This is the what I'm telling y'all. That's why I want y'all to really take it serious. Because what I'm telling y'all is the difference of you having the millions and millions of tax-free dollars more over your next 20 to 30 years versus being in a situation where you run out of money. It's that serious. 
But most people don't understand how it works because they don't take the time to, to invest in themselves like you did and actually say, I'm paying money to build my trust and learn about different strategies that I can do. And that's what you did. And that's why I'm teaching, why I'm teaching you. Okay. All right. So here's the other thing. I'm going to teach you a visual of how this works when you're borrowing against your money. Okay. Okay, so this is how it works. So you got the, your insurance policy. It's that green bucket right here. You got the death benefit. Remember? You're going to borrow against the policy, and if you don't pay it back, it's subtracted from the death benefit. So what you do is you let your money continue to grow. That's called collateral. And you're going to borrow from the insurance company. Now, when you borrow from the insurance company, let me go back a little bit. Okay. When you borrow from the insurance company, they're going to use your cash value as collateral because you got to pay it back. If you don't pay it back, you're going to pay it back when you die. They're going to give you an interest only loan. You go take that loan and you buy you an asset, like you said, Ronnie. And then, then you pay it back non-structured, which means you pay the insurance company back as you please when you decide to, even though I recommend you put yourself on the schedule. And when, when that happens, it's going to pay off the collateral on the insurance policy. So the insurance policy was growing by itself. And it grew because you paid off the loan. And now you got that big amount to borrow from again and keep repeating that cycle over and over and over again. Right? So that's how it works. So let's just say I got a $500,000 death benefit. There's a minimum amount that I can pay to get that $500,000 death benefit. And there's also a maximum amount. Who do you all think decides the minimum amount? It's not you. It's the insurance company. Who do you think determines the maximum amount? It's not you. It's the government. Why would the government ever be concerned with how much money you put into these policies? One word, taxes. So there are a lot of different ways to structure these policies, but to be the most tax efficient, you have to structure it the way that I'm, I'm going to teach you. So in the 1980s, the government basically were tired of rich people just pouring all of their money into these accounts. So they created the 401k and the IRAs called a qualified plan, which means that when you take the money out, they're going to tax you like crazy. See, insurance, I mean, people would put millions of dollars into insurance companies in the past because they knew that they didn't, they didn't have to pay taxes. It wasn't reportable to the IRS. Now, the government gives you a maximum that if you exceed, it's going to be called a modified endowment contract, which means that they can treat it the same way they treat a 401k and tax it. But if you do it the right way, you eliminate that tax forever, which is what I teach. You want to fund it over at least five to seven years. Now, if I put the $500 was a minimum and $10,000 was a maximum, the minimum is called term insurance. It comes with no cash value. It comes with nothing but a death benefit that expires. The maximum amount is called cash value permanent policy, either an IUL or a whole life. The IUL or whole life both have tax-free growth, tax-free distributions, competitive return. And let me stop you. I'm not just saying the IUL or whole life. So you cannot just go to any insurance agent and just say, I want an IUL or a whole life because they can structure it the wrong way and make you pay 70% more fees. And the money won't go to your cash value and it would take you years to be able to borrow from it. You got to structure it the right way. You're going to have high contributions, additional benefits, the ability to borrow. It's going to be safe. No loss provisions, guaranteed loan options that you can borrow, unstructured loan payments. You pay it off when you want to. Liquidity use and control. You don't have to wait until you're 59 and a half to touch your money. Right? So we want to structure it with the lowest death benefit, you all, and the highest cash value. Why do we do it that way? Because more of your money goes to work for you and less of your money goes to the, the agent and commissions. So at my company, when we help you set up your policy, we take 70% less commission to make sure we set it up the right way for you. So again, that's a 10 minute lesson on life insurance. That's how life insurance works, okay? So with that being said, you all, this is a very powerful concept. And when you combine that with the trust, oh my God, it's so powerful because not only did you make money multiple times, 
but you also were able to put yourself into a position where you protected all of your assets with the with the irrevocable life insurance, I mean the irrevocable trust. Now the trust can be the owner and the beneficiary of your life insurance policy. So it works hand in hand, which is why me and Christina's partnership works so well together because I don't do what she does and she doesn't do what I do, but together it becomes a very powerful concept when you combine those two strategies together. This is what wealthy people are doing. This is what the Rockefellers did. When they talk about in the book, what would the Rockefellers do? They were talking about utilizing life insurance, having board meetings, like Christina taught you, making your wishes known to the next generation and utilizing life insurance as your funding method for businesses to keep that money flowing generation after generation after generation. So with that being said, I know um, Christina has a link where if you all do want to set up a call to, um, to, to schedule your life insurance meeting with my team, complimentary. We work hand in hand with Christina and her team to make sure we give you a pretty seamless transition. Uh, I do want to make sure there's one caveat, like IUL is great because it's going to make your money grow faster. You're going to be able to use more income over time. Uh, and it's a great long-term strategy. However, I, I do have to start saying that in most IUL policies, it takes about a year where you can really start to borrow from it. And that's okay. I mean, you wait 20 or 30 years to get money from your 401k. What's one year? Uh, but if so, you want higher growth, it's okay to get the IUL. Now, if you are okay with lower growth, but you want to borrow from it quicker, then that's when you go with whole life because it's going to be a fixed rate of return, but you have more access to borrow from the money quicker. So if you knew you wanted to flip this money in 30 days and put it into, into some real estate, you will probably go with the whole life. But if you were looking to make it last and get income that's going to be tax-free for the rest of your life or retirement or something and use it and you can wait at least a year, then, uh, then the index, there's, there's no right or wrong answer. It just depends on what you want to do. And that's what my team discussed with you when you meet with our team. Make sense? All right, Christina, is there anything that you want me to talk about next? Thank you so much, Marvin. I appreciate you coming in and pouring into the community and educating us on infinite banking. So I'm going to open up the floor for questions. So if you have any questions for Marvin, please raise your hand, come off mute. Let us know what your questions are in regards to infinite banking. Let's go. Okay, so I have a question. Go ahead. All right. All right. So my question is basically when it comes to the IUL policy, because why does it have to be a whole year before I can use it? Oh, because so it's give and take, right? Great question. So mm -hmm. in the IUL, you got higher return potential. So for example, let's say your return potential was 12%. If the market makes five, you can make five, it makes 10, you can make 10, if it makes 12, you can make 12. So you can make up to 12% and it's guaranteed that you don't lose nothing when it goes down. So in order to give you those type of benefits, the exchange is, is that they want to allow those benefits to grow a little bit in it before you start just borrowing against it, right? Or else there's a, a surrender attached to it. Um, the whole life gives you a lot less return. We might be talking about 5%, maybe six. So because of that, you have the ability to borrow from it quicker because over the long haul, your returns should be lower. So it's always give or take, right? They're, they're not going to give you both. It's either one or the other or 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 um, a combination of both if you do both types of policies. See, me, I own both. I have whole life and I have index universal life. They're both great. Um, it just depends on what your needs are. Okay, so Marvin. Um, go ahead, Ronnie. You were still finishing. I'll come right back to you, Ken. Okay, so um, I've heard where people say overfund the policy. What is that's that what you're doing? Overfunding Over, the policy. So, so okay. So I I mentioned that you want to do the lowest amount of death benefit for the highest amount of cash value, right? So typically the death benefit is here and people are paying a premium for the death benefit that's here. But if your death benefit is here and you're putting the same amount of premium in there, you're overfunded the policy because the death benefit was here, but all that extra money you put in 
went to the cash value. So that's called overfunding the policy. Why do you do that? Because there's more cash value for you to borrow against now that you have access to that money and you only had to pay typically commissions for up to the amount of the death benefit. So if you get the lowest amount of death benefit, you only had to pay the commission for the death benefit and the rest of it was your cash value. But if you get the higher death benefit, you pay commission on that big death benefit, which takes all of your money away from your cash value to be able to borrow against. So even though you okay. have a bigger death benefit with a low premium, you don't have the ability to use it much for your life. Okay, so so I need you to kind of like put numbers to that if you can, so I can kind of understand it just a little bit better. Because when you say a lower death benefit, like what is that? All right, so let's just say your premium, going back to the situation, let's just say your death benefit, you got a $500,000 death benefit and mm -hmm. your premium is $3,000 for the year. So a $500,000 death benefit and your premium was $3,000. You funded it for the highest death benefit for the least amount of premium. It's $3,000 that you're paying, but your cash value doesn't really build up. Okay? okay? Because most of what you're paying for is the death benefit. That's that $3,000. Making sense so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, now, you're you can get that same $500,000 death benefit for a $10,000 premium. So why would you do a $10,000 premium when you could have did a $3,000. It's because that extra $7,000 goes to your cash value and you only had to pay the, the commission on the $3,000, but that extra $7,000 went towards your cash value and that money is growing tax-free every year as if you never touched it and you can borrow from that money and leverage it. So again, you just, you just paid a higher premium and a higher premium allow your money to flow to the cash value so you can borrow against it. Whereas if you only want to put, a, put the minimum amount in the death benefit, there would have been no room to grow for the cash value because most of that money would have went to the agent. Okay, so my question is, what would you say is a good number for a death benefit for a young person like myself? Uh, What are you, 18? No, I'm 29. She oh, okay. <laughs> so 29. <laughs> All right. So if you're 29, mm -hmm. if you're 29, I don't know, when I started, when I was 25, and it really depends on how much you can put in. When I was 25 and I started mine, I was putting in 10000 a year. Um, and it gave me a death benefit of like $700,000. Um, so it depends. It's not about the death benefit. Remember, it's for you, it's not going to be necessarily about the death benefit. You can actually yeah. buy some term to make a bigger death benefit. But really, what this is about is what is the lowest amount of death benefit you can get for the highest cash value. So if you yeah. put in if you put in ten thousand dollars a year, maybe your death benefit is seven hundred thousand. So around five to seven hundred thousand is probably a good starting point or lower. You don't have to put in that much. I, I got people who put in $200 a month and they have like a $250,000 death benefit. So it just depends on what you can do. Okay. Cause I've been trying to figure out because I wanted to officially start mine and like I have excess money where I can, you know, do it. And I didn't know yeah. what was a good number because I thought maybe like paying 500 a month would be good. But then. So, I was like, so oh. what, I'm, so what I'm going to do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, have, Christina, give you the link to schedule some time with my team and we'll explain all of that to you. And we'll also show you some numbers behind it, too, where you can see some illustrations so you can see exactly how it would look for you. Remember, you I don't want you to think about what's the least amount you can put in. I want you to think about what's the most that you can put in because you can actually use that money to fund different projects. So we're, we'll I'm give you some different options and you can actually me. choose those options. Right. It's just it's a different level of thinking. Most of the time we're thinking about what's the least I can put in. That's called thinking from a scarcity mindset. That's called I just want to make sure I don't have to have a fish fry when I die. That's that type of thinking. <laughs> I want to make sure I don't have to start a GoFundMe account. That's that kind of thinking. I get we don't want to think of it like poor people. We want to think of it like wealthy people. And wealthy people are thinking, what's the most I can put in there? Because this goes, this is going to shelter me from taxation. This is going to hide it from the IRS. This is going to allow me to borrow from it and buy real estate and the IRS doesn't have to know what I'm doing. This is going to allow me to go out and, um, you know, flip this into different assets while my money is still growing as if I never touched it. This is going to give me the power to leverage my money and have full liquidity use and control of my money. You see the different thinking, limited thinking, 
the least. I want to avoid. I want to at least get a burial. Rich people don't need, think about it. They don't need life insurance. What do they need life insurance for? They already rich. They don't need life insurance. So if they don't need life insurance, you have to start to ask yourself, why would they want life insurance? Why would a person who don't need life insurance want life insurance? The only reason why the Rockefellers, they were billionaires. So why would they need life insurance? They don't need life insurance. They wanted it because they knew it was going to be able to be leveraged to the next generation at a fraction of the cost. They were buying wealth. They also knew that they would be able to borrow against it to go out and buy store companies and buy businesses and allow their family to borrow against it and buy businesses and write up you know, contracts that they can become the bank, right? So I want you to think about it from the concept of, I want to become the bank, not just avoid a catastrophe. I don't want to think in a survival mode. I want to think in a thriving mode. Make sense? Yeah. All right, cool. All right, hopefully that answered. I saw some people in the chat saying, um, this answered my question um, as well. A couple of people said, we, your questions, Ronnie, answered a couple other people's questions, but we got um, Marquita, Mar Marquita, and then we'll get to seven. Uh, Evan, go ahead, um, Mar Marquita. Seven. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, my question um was for the whole life, the one that you said you could kind of borrow from immediately. Mm -hmm. Um, what would be the normal percentage of cash value that's available? Uh, Great question. Typically, a good policy is going to be between seventy-five and eighty percent after about thirty days. If you do the whole life. Okay. That's a great how, question. How much you said? Uh, within 30 days, you said? Right. Oh. Within 30 days. And, and quite frankly, sometimes a lot less. But we just tell you 30 days um, to make sure that you, you know, uh, we under promise, so to speak. But I've seen people who borrow from their policy after only 15 days. But I do tell you 30 days just for a reasonable expectation. Okay, great. And um, so when you, I guess, funnel it through your, uh, I guess, what's the difference between borrowing it outright from the insurance company as opposed to putting it in your trust? Uh, what's the what's the difference? Great question. Think of think of the trust as a shell of protection over everything that you do, right? Okay. Okay. The life insurance. Think of that as an asset. The trust in itself is a different kind of asset because it's not like an asset from an as a as an investment standpoint but it's an asset that protects your other assets. So if you think about the trust as an umbrella to protect So think about yourself standing under under an umbrella and it's raining outside. Think of the trust as an umbrella as long as it's under the umbrella you protect it from the rain. Right? Now think of inside of that umbrella you still exist. Those are going to be your assets. So stocks, investments, real estate, life insurance are all of the things that are going to be under that umbrella that's protected by the trust. Makes sense? So you can actually set it up where you have the life insurance policy and you have the trust protecting the life insurance policy and you're actually borrowing from the life insurance, but it's still under the guise of the trust because the trust is still the umbrella. And you're still staying under the umbrella, even though you're borrowing from the life insurance policy. Hopefully that makes sense. Yes. No, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Seven. Hey, how you doing, Marvin? Doing wonderful. How you doing? Hey, so I'm doing good, man. Thanks for asking. I wanted to ask, uh, based on the interest, uh, can you give us an example based on the uh the con is it's based on a compound interest uh, perception, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so could you give us a a small number, say like a hundred dollars, and a percentage, and explain how the compound interest works, equating to profit? Because the concept of right. uh, compound interest, I just try to wrap my mind around how that actually pays out into bringing yeah. that profit. So if you put $100 into something and you're going to get 5%, what does that compound interest look like? Let's just say month to month, per se. Sure. Let's just say yeah, let month to month, is year you. to year, something like that. Yeah, good question. Give me one Thanks. second. All right. So when you say compound interest is the eighth one in the world, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. 
All right. Let me share my screen again. Okay. So let's just say you're 42 years old and you are saving into your 60. Wait a minute. No. I'm not, I'm going to show you a different one. I'm going to show you a different one. Gonna make more sense. Give me a second. Hold on one second. I'm just finding it to make it make sense for you. It's okay. It's just that the compound interest thing, I don't know if everyone knows how compound interest actually works. And it's it's, it's really yep. a concept to wrap your mind around. Absolutely. It's powerful. All right. Here we go. Yeah, this would be worth it. I just got to find it. Um, this would be a powerful illustration. Perfect. Here we go. I used to find this thing right away. If opening up the wrong one, hold on. That's okay. Thank you, Marvin, for being so thorough with the community. I know that we all appreciate it. So, you guys, so if you're getting value from what Marvin is teaching us, put a one in the chat. We Thank want to you. make sure that you guys are still with us. Here we go. I think I found it. I All think right. I it. Aisha, Flo, Solomon, Andre. All right. Seven. Rashad. <laughs> Nancy. All right. Thank you. Y'all are amazing. This is an amazing class. This is actually, I gotta give you, I gotta give you um, I gotta give y'all y'all props on in this class. It's uh a small amount of people. Um, sometimes she has more, but it's probably the most engaged class when it comes to more thorough questions, which is a great thing. So you all have came to learn, and I always appreciate that. Sure. Yeah, the community, that's what they're here for. They intentionally want to build wealth. So they set up their trust Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Then yesterday we learned about business credit for the business trust. Today we learned about transferring assets and infinite banking. So your mm. um so your policy needs to be the first asset for your trust, you guys. Like you need to put your policies inside of your trust. So if you already have a policy, then contact um contact that carrier and let them know that you set up a trust and you want to change the ownership. You also want to book a call with Marvin's team to have them review your policy to make sure that it was properly structured because that makes all the difference. I have heard of people literally tell me, and I think it was with like New York something, something, but they told me like, I can't borrow from my policy for 10 years. I'm like, what? I'm a, And I'm literally yeah, looking crazy. at I'm like, like, you are leaving so much money on the table. So you want to make sure that you have the right policy, because if not, literally, you are throwing your money away. Like, just get a trash can and start dumping it in there. <laughs> Seriously. 
You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to you on that because I'm gonna find this. I'm gonna show y'all this before we get off because I think this this is gonna answer all of y'all questions on compound for whatever reason though. I had I have this tool bookmark and for whatever reason it got unbookmarked. So I'm kind of digging through to find it. But I'll go ahead and answer Rashad's question first. Hey, how's it going, Marvin? I'm good. How are you, Rashad? I'm doing great. Doing great. Uh question for you. You may have asked the question before somebody else. I came in a little bit late today. Mm -hmm. uh, scenario. So if I had a policy. And I contributed like ten thousand dollars in premium over the first twelve months. Let's say it was worth five hundred grand. After the twelve months, how much could I borrow against that hypothetical policy? So if you got an IUL and you were uh, ten thousand five hundred thousand, uh, at that case, one year later, you should probably be able to borrow about between eighty to eighty five percent from that of from that five, money of the five hundred. Okay, correct. All right. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> the You don't borrow. I'm glad you said this. This is a good clarification. I'm so glad I caught myself. Would have would have told y'all all the wrong thing. So remember, when you're putting a $10,000 in there and your death benefit is $500,000, you don't borrow from the death benefit. You borrow from your cash value. So if you put ten thousand dollars in there over a course of a year, that's one hundred and twenty thousand. You're able to borrow eighty five percent of that, not the five hundred thousand, because the five hundred thousand is the death benefit. The benefit of the death benefit is that if you don't pay it back, which you don't have to, the amount you borrow plus interest will be subtracted from the death benefit, and the death benefit is always more than the cash value. So you'll have the freedom of knowing that your policy won't. Um, be in a be in a position where like you know your heirs won't have any money uh if you don't pay it back now again i want you to pay it back because it increases your borrowing capacity but remember we're only borrowing against our own money we're not borrowing against the death benefit now are there ways to access the death benefit early um before you die yes but not by borrowing from it the only way you can access the death benefit early is if you have if you're sick you have a long-term care situation, and sometimes they allow you to access some of that death benefit tax-free early to take care of those physical ailments and different things like that if you get the right type of rider on it, but not to borrow against it. Okay. All right. Thanks. No problem. That's a great question. Anything else? I'm good. I have a question. Yep. Um what is the interest based on? I know there's two different types of policies that you explained for the IUL. And one of them is, I believe the whole life is what you're saying, is the one, yep. what is that based on interest-wise? How is the so interest- So the whole life the whole life in the index universal life is based on two different things. The whole life is based on just the going interest rates at that particular time. So if I can get 5% at a bank, typically I could probably get 6%. It's always a little bit higher than a bank. Um, uh -huh. at, on my whole life, right? So you think about whole life, it's just a smart place to save your money. It's a really, it's a saving, they call, we call it a wealth storehouse where instead of you saving it in a bank, you can save it into your IUL, I mean, your cash, your whole life, because then you can borrow against that money, right? right. Whereas in a bank, you can't borrow against it. So if you borrow against it, it's still growing, right? Um, right. The IUL is based on the index, so let's say the index we choose is the S&P 500, which is the most right. commonly used. So it's not in the stock market, but they take a look at what the S&P index in the stock market did. So the S&P did 10%. They're going to mirror that and credit you with 10%. If your cap right. is 12 and the S&P did 20%, then they're going to credit you with the 12% because they hit your maximum gain, your cap. But if the S&P loses money, remember, you can't lose. You at least stay the same. So you can make up to a certain amount. But if the market goes down, you stay the same. So, again, the whole life is based on the going interest rates, the Fed rates, et cetera. The whole life is based on, I mean, the index universal dollar life is based on the S&P index or whatever index that you choose. So it will only go up in percentage per se is what you're saying. Correct. You correct. You, you won't lose because it's protection from downside loss. The only way now, if the market does, if the market does zero, 
you still have to pay the fees, whatever minimum fees there are in the policy. So technically, it could slightly go down because of the fees if the market went down, but it will never go down because of a market loss. Okay. So which one is the best uh, one between the two options in the IUL, which is uh, privy toward using it for real estate? It depends. I mean, if you if you could wait a year, then the whole then the index of universal life is still good. But if you have have a property that's out there, like for example, me, I I've had a I had an IUL. Well, I had a whole life first. Then I learned about IUL, and then I put I got like three IULs in a row because I like the fact that I could just let it sit for a minute, and I knew I was going to be able to make it grow more, which it did, right? Right. But I just went back and bought me another whole life. And I put $500,000 into a whole life, but it was for a specific reason. I put the $500,000 into the whole life because um, I got taxes that's 400 grand. And I was like, I'm not just going to pay the IRS $400,000 to see my cash go down. So let exactly. me dump that cash into the whole life, but I need to borrow within 30 days so I could take that money and then pay the IRS. And now my 500000 continue to grow as if I never touched it. Make sense? Got it. Got it. That yeah, that's leverage. Okay, exactly. good. Thank you for that. Exactly. And I think that's it. I apologize. I cannot find. I cannot find it. But uh, I was going to show you a calculation that showed you compound interest and a cost of waiting just like five years. Uh, if you just you know waited like five years, how much of a difference it would make. And this has always been right in front of me because I always use it. And I don't know if I accidentally deleted it or what, but I don't see it. But if I do find it, I will get it to Christina so that she can um, get it out to you all. Thank you, Marvin. So I'm going to take some questions. I don't know if you still want to look for it or not, but thank you so much. Yeah, we while you're taking questions, I'll look for it for a minute. Okay, thank you so much. All right, guys. So do you guys have any questions about any of the information that I went over today? So we had talked about, you know, um, transferring assets into our trust, right? So we had started off with our asset inventory list. We went on to filling out our quick claim deeds, our bill of sales for our vehicles and the business purchase agreement and amendments for the LLCs and corporations. So does anybody have any questions on the information? So I see seven. Hey, seven. Hey, how you doing, Christina? Good, good, um, good. Good, good. I um I had a couple of questions about the uh, trusts. Uh, does it matter in which order any trusts are set up, or is there a specific order in setting them up between, say, are family, ministry, and business? No, so we do everything simultaneously. So it doesn't make any sense to do it one at a time when you know you're going to set up all of the all of the entities. Some people decide not to set up all of the entities, but if you know you are going to set up all of the entities, do everything simultaneously. So create all of them at the same time, notarize all of them at the same time, apply for your EINs all at the same time, open up your bank accounts, go to the bank one time instead of three individual times. Right. Okay. So um, I saw something somewhere, I think, in the in the group where we were talking, well, someone mentioned being able to set up accounts uh, like, say, Truist or something, I believe, or was it Ally, uh, mm -hmm. that you could do it online? You don't have to actually go to the branch? Correct. Um, so Ally is an online only bank. There is no branch. So you can, so that is an online bank that you can set up your trust fund with Ally. So that's one of the banks that I recommend. So it, um, I do have a training module inside of the course and the name of the training is under asset protection. The name of the training is, um, create a bank account. And I walk you through the entire application process for Ally Bank. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks for that. Um, yeah. let's see about transferring like a, a vehicle or something into one of the trusts. If you were to transfer it, say like into the ministry and the ministry is, I guess, nonprofit, does that incur any fees or can you have a fee waiver and such things? Are there ways to uh, make fee waivers? Um, so there are, um, transfer fees. 
So you, it depends on your county, right? Um, you're going to make the transfer through your DMV and they have their own fees. So your DMV and my DMV are two different DMVs because right. of two different states. So I'm not sure what your fees are over there in California. So um, you can let them know that you have a nonprofit that's tax exempt. And then if they have you sign specific paperwork to waive those fees, then you can go forward with that. Um, and usually because we're gifting it, um, there's, you know, very little taxes because you can literally put a dollar, $50, $100 because it's a gift. But sometimes some DMVs require a dollar amount. Some people, some DMVs allow you to put zero. So um, as far as taxes, then, um, you know, you could be exempt from those taxes, but you do have to apply for that exemption if you want it to be exempt from sales taxes. So you have to go through the state of California. Um, and I do have a training video on that, not specifically for California, but to show you how to apply for sales tax exemption. Right. Is that in the uh, in the portal? It is. Everything's in the portal, everything that you um, will need. OK, because I, I see two sides on the portal for me um, where I see some of the the defining factors of what things are grantor, you know, trustee stuff like that on one side. Then the other side is the, uh, oh, the recorded videos. Mm -hmm. and so, it's so, it, so it's in the course. So it's in the course. You go all the way down to um, the section that talks about taxes and you'll find it there. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Seven. All right. Next we have Andre. What's up? How are you? How are you doing, Christina? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. How are you? Okay. All right. It's a good day then. So, um, yeah, I see you doing at work. <laughs> True. Well, yes and no. I'm, I'm teleworking. So, I'm, I'm kind of oh, okay, yeah, okay, okay. sitting on both sides oh. of the house here. Awesome. Yeah, I, I just want to thank you for the workshop. Lots of information over these past few days, like I said, I've been waffling back and forth between work and this and everything like that. I know I even started out with the course, sipping through the videos there, the resources that you got there, the books. I'm still, yeah, I mean, maybe Sunday, I'll probably take a look at the books again. Um, Marvin, is he still here? Yeah, Marvin's still here. Okay, I wanna thank you for what she just presented. Hey. Within less than 20 minutes, you have brought a lot of information to light. I now have a better understanding between an IUL and a whole permanent life insurance policy. I've talked to many other people. They couldn't simplify it just the way you did. I even have a relative, my family who's in the insurance game, has never even spoken to me in this manner. We talked about this maybe 15 years ago. So in a roundabout way, I feel kind of cheated, but I know what I need to do to move forward. So I just want to thank the both of you for what you just presented here. Thank you so much, Andre. I appreciate you being a part of the community. I appreciate you enrolling, you know, into the workshop and actually trusting us thank to provide you. with the, you know, with the most accurate information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Marvin and I, we're going to be a resource for you to help you set up this whole entire thing so that you can build wealth and transfer it the right way. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Next, we have Rashad. Hey, how's it going? Great. How are you, Rashad? I'm doing great. Uh, the question is, can a person put one asset in more than one trust? For example, let's say a person wants to put the private residence uh, in, the in the ministry trust and like the family trust. Can they only put that one asset in one particular trust? So, um, yes, you can have the same asset in multiple trusts, but it's not going to have 100% ownership. So you would have to split up the ownership. So, for example, that one house, if you want 50% of it to be owned by the family trust, you can do that. And 50% of it to be owned by the ministry trust, you can do that. And then on the deed is literally going to have the two names of the trust. So it's it um it's not right. necessary for you to put it in two trusts because it's still going to be fully protected in one trust. So people don't right. usually do that. Um I personally wouldn't do that. 
Um, but if that's something that you feel is going to benefit, you know, you or your family, then go for it. So you can have multiple entities as the owner of, um, of your piece of real estate. So all of the, by the way, are... I, I did ahead. find that. Really you did, you found it. Okay. It's not uh, even going to be like, I like hyped it up way too much now, it is, but you, you going you're going to get like an idea of the power of compound interest at least. So uh, let's just say you got a person who is 25 that's saving until they're 65. And let's say they're earning like a compound interest of 7%, just making it up. So what this is showing you is the power of compound interest. Let's just, let's just say they're making, um, Let's just say they are contributing $500 a month. That's it. And we're not even increasing that per year. They're just doing 500 every single month. They never increase it due to inflation, just to give you all the simple way this works. But if we add that up, because of compound interest, the total amount that they contribute, this is, I'm sorry, this is annual. That's not 500 a month. So let's change it to 6,000. Because that would be 5000 a month. So you see, you contributed $240,000 during that time frame. And because of compound interest, you're at $1,281,657, right? So all of that growth was because of compound interest every single year. Now, Let's just say you decided not to contribute at 25 and you said, let me wait until I'm 30 to start this policy or to start contributing this $6,000 or $500 a month. Just waiting those five years to get to that same $1,281,657, you would have had to contribute $303,000 and you would have had to contribute $8,665 because you lost five years of compound interest. If you would have waited until you're 40, now you would have had to contribute $18,938 um, a year, uh, which is 473000 total just to get to that same $1,281,000. So I think y'all get the point. If you wait until you're 50, now you would have had to contribute $714,996 to get to that same $1,281,657, which is a total of 47666 annually. So as you all can see, it pays to start early because you you start to allow compound interest to work in your favor instead of working against you. So does that make sense? That's how that yes, works. That's the, power, that's the power of compound interest and starting. The best time is when is the, whenever you're contributing and you're adding money to your investment portfolio, your insurance policy, your Roth. When do you all think the best time to start is? Write it in the chat. When is the best time to start? Now, the best time to start is always now. Because every day that you wait, you are you are costing yourself money because you are not letting the power of compound interest work for you. Same thing with your insurance. You're not letting it work for you. If you keep waiting to do it, not only are you the cash value is taking a, a longer time to grow because you started later. But when you get the older that you get, the harder it is to actually get accepted and approved for the life insurance. And also, um, and also the growth is a little bit slower the older that you are. So not only will you have to contribute more, but it's growing a little bit slower. So you want to start it as soon as you can. I have people who started when they're 70. I have people who started when they're 20. The best part is to get started. So, all right, Evan, hopefully that answered your question. So, so, all right, I'm happy I found it. I'm like, this is going to bother me if I can't find it. You can go back to go back to everything, Christina. Yeah, so, um, so Mashan said, um, so you're saying it's too late for folks in their mid-40s like myself. That's not true, right, Marvin? The best time to start, no matter if you're watching this, the best time to start is when? Now. So... So it's just like saying, you know, I'm 40 and I haven't started, so I guess I won't do it then. 
Like you can't make up for what you didn't do, but you can change what happens going forward. So it's like me saying I'm running in a forest in the wrong direction. I know I'm running in the wrong direction, but because I'm already running in the wrong direction, I might as well keep running in the wrong direction and keep going further and further and further away. Does that make any sense? At some point, I'm going to have to realize I'm running the wrong direction and just turn around. Now, granted, I have to take a while to catch back up to where I started from when I started running in the wrong direction. But at least I'm running in the right direction. So it's always better to start moving in the right direction instead of just giving up just because you never did it before. All right. Love that. Thank you, Marvin. So I just want to give a shout out to Mashawn, um, to Mashawn Sanders and to Ronnie Allen, because those are our day ones. OK, so they actually are our founders for the Wealthy Trustee Program. They actually came in um, in 2022. So I just want to give a shout out to them because I'm so excited to see them on the call today. So um, I'm going to keep going on with the questions. So we got Solomon. Hey, Solomon. All right, Christina. Thank you. And thank you, Marvin. I appreciate that. Uh, Hope you're feeling much. better. I am much better, much better. Um, I have a couple of questions in right. regards to automobiles and the trust. Yeah. Um, how exactly does the car insurance, because I, I've registered uh, automobiles and motorcycles to trust before. And there's always been issues with the insurance and also with registration because they always want to, they always attempt to force me to attach the registration to my license. And I always try to explain to them that this car is registered to a trust. I am a trustee. There could be several trustees and any one of the trustees can use the, the automobile. So you can't attach it to any trustee in particular and it's always just a thing trying to explain that to him i usually have to print out law and bring it with me and then it's the same thing with the auto insurance i don't know if they're playing the game you know because i'm usually dealing with them over the phone but they usually try to act ignorant and they'll give me what i want in regards to a printout for for dmv like if i explain to them that the car is owned by a trust now and the insurance must say you know, TST at the end, they'll do that for me. But that's not registered in their system. They're willing to give me that for DMV. But they always tell me that they don't know how to actually make that uh, option in their system uh, to where the car is under a trust for the insurance. Yeah, so you're going to have to you're going to find these types of challenges because they could actually be telling the truth where they don't have the option, right? We seen it yesterday where one particular company they didn't have the option of um us labeling it in the name of a trust or us labeling ourselves as trustees. So it could be true with that particular organization and that's why you have to have, you know, patience with these people because there's a lot of education that you have to educate like like you said like there's ignorance involved because they don't know they're not familiar they've probably never even spoke to a trustee before and so um sometimes when you're dealing with these companies you have to go to the higher ups right so you have to ask them because the basic agents that you're speaking to they they probably have you know have no clue how to even make those adjustments so i always um ask them to speak with um, like a regional director, or sometimes I've even asked to speak to the CEO, um, to CEO or COO or someone like that, who's able to really assist because, um, because the, you know, the person that's, you know, that you're meeting with initially, they probably don't have that power and control to be able to make those changes. So that's one. And then two, um, when we're talking about like the, the DMB, and stuff. It just depends on um, it just depends on your DMV, but they should not be attaching it to your license. So it it is um, it is a separate entity. It is a living entity. And so it has to just, you know, be um, separate from you. So they're not allowed to do that. So th that that is you actually providing more uh, information, more education. 
So I always tell people like use your certificate of Trump. And I like what you said about um, about printing out law. So if you print out like, you know, information from the um, commercial code, the UCC, then you'll probably get them to, you know, to back off to where they don't have to or don't, you know, don't need to do that. I've seen people um, even relinquish their license. So that's not something that I've done, but I've seen it to where they've relinquished their license um, so that they don't have to, you know, keep going forward with this. I mean, I've been to motor vehicles uh, to DMVs where um, several, and they said they've never registered an a automobile to a trust. And I had to actually print out the DMV instructions for them, showing them step by step how they supposed to do it from their website. I said, this is from your website. Is that insane here in New York? Um, right. And, and, yeah. and it's that one individual that hasn't done it. So they're like lying and telling you, hey, like this whole organization, everybody here in the DMV. No, it's that one individual. And, uh, OK, here's my other question. And this may be just me uh, overthinking. Um, I know you you mentioned about uh, if you own a home that you mentioned putting it in the business trust. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is where I may be overthinking. Um, mm -hmm. Since the 508 mm -hmm. is, is the actual tax exempt entity. And I know, I believe, I don't, I'm not sure if I know, but I believe so far from my research that a 508 is allowed to own one property right and no more than one correct. house no almost. correct 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 so because the, the the 508 is tax exempt um you are only allowed to have one property to qualify for that for that exemption so you can't have multiple properties under one entity that's exempt so it can only be applicable for one so if you have 10 properties then and you want all 10 of them to be exempt then you need 10 um 508s one per property so you're right <laughs> Would that exemption apply to property taxes? Correct. Yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. So the property has to be in the name of the ministry trust. And I was given an example a couple of days ago when we were going through the ministry trust about real estate investors that they use that as a strategy. And, and some of these investors are in our community, right, where they have commercial units. They have like, you know, um, stores on the bottom. They have apartments on the top. Um, where they use it um, for this particular strategy to where they're exempt from the property taxes. But like I said, you have to have one, um, one 508 per uh, property, and then you could have that tenant as a member of your 508, and then their donations or you know, their contribution to the ministry is whatever their quote unquote rent is, right? So it's not rent, but it's their donation to the 508. So that is exempt because it's not income. So, okay, thank you. And so depending upon, I guess, the, the, the individual's uh, situation, would it be wiser to uh, put the house in the 508 trust instead of the business trust? Like if this is their only home that they live in and they want to avoid the property taxes moving forward would, I mean, I guess, because I know you mentioned putting the house in the business trust. I'm just trying to wrap my head around, uh, you know, the difference between that and the 508 and why would, you, why would we choose either or for, for the house if you only own one home that you live in? Yeah, I'm so I'm sorry if I'm not making any sense. Oh, oh yeah, no, no, not a problem. So um, one, I recommend that it goes inside of the family trust only because your children are the direct beneficiaries of the family trust. So I recommend that it goes inside of the family trust. If you have um, investment properties, then you can put it inside of the business trust if you want to. But if it's like your primary residence, then you want to put it inside of the family trust, right? But if you um, 
want to put it inside of the ministry trust so that you can benefit from property tax exemption, then that's another strategy. The reason why I don't tell people to do that, right? Because you have to understand, right, what direction you want to go to go in because everyone needs to, um, you know, make this decision for their, as you know, on their own. So with the ministry trust, right, the beneficiary cannot be your children, right? So the beneficiary has to be another entity. So that entity is either, you know, an LLC or a corporation, a society, another, another charity, another ministry, a church, um, another entity, which is a trust or, um, you know, so, something like that. Right. So because that's the case, you, you have to understand that, um, that when that entity is due to expire, who is that asset going to go to, right? So it has to go to another entity. So that's why I always tell people, well, um, put your family trust there, right? So because it qualifies as being one of the beneficiaries for the ministry trust. So, um, so that will be the process, right? So now that real estate uh, will go from the ministry trust. If the ministry trust is dissolved, it'll go from the ministry trust to the family trust. And then from the family trust, then your children will be able to benefit that way. So there's still, you know, a couple of uh, layers before it actually gets to the beneficiaries. That's why I always tell people just, if it's your primary residence, right? Go ahead and put it in the family trust. But if you want to use this strategy to where you're exempt from property taxes and put it in the ministry trust. So, yeah. um, so that's a decision that you personally need to make for your family. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to thank brother Marvin again. And uh, this is no disrespect to anyone on the call, but this has truly been how to set up trust for dummies. The way you break it down and even the way Brother Marvin broke down the difference between IUL and whole life insurance, this whole week has just been a blast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you, Solomon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Next, we got Marquita. Hey, Marquita. Hey, um, thank you. Yeah, I second everyone's sentiment. This has been awesome. Um course and the information is so invaluable. Okay, second question. Um, I want to know, now that I have a, a better understanding of, of, you know, gifting the trust with the life insurance, are there any restrictions um, as far as with your business trust and your family trust? So if I wanted to, let's say, do the IUL in the business trust, and I know you said that you have to be able to, um, if you're going to you know, withdraw some money, then yes. So if I do the IUL in a business trust and I say a year later after um, get some cash advance or something, I want to use that to put into an investment property. Um, is that the only reason you could, like you can't, with the business trust, you could only use it on business investments, correct? Is so I, I always recommend, thank you, Marquita. So I, for this good question, I always recommend people operate their trust the right way, operate it the way that it's intended to be operated. Okay. So if you have a business and you have a business trust, operate your business trust for business purposes, right? So if your business is real estate and you're investing in real estate, then go ahead and operate it like a real estate investment company, okay? So when it comes to you being able to have your policy inside of the business trust, absolutely. You want to know why? Because you are the key person or what we call key man, right? So you're the key man for that entity, right? Because at the end of the day, if you're the CEO, CFO, if you're the authorized member, whoever of that company, what is going to happen to the company if something happens to you? right? I can't even fathom what's going to happen to my company if I can't show up and teach you guys, right? So because that's the case, you can put insurance on yourself and have the company pay the policy because you're the key man in that company. So can you have your IUL policy owned by your business trust? Absolutely, yes. Um, and then what was the second part of your question? Was there a second part besides that? 
Um, well, that was the main thing, whether okay. um, there are any type of restrictions. And uh, so if I had something else, like the example that Marvin gave, if like, let's say you had some other stuff, like you wanted to pay your taxes or something like the whole life, you, you would, that would better be fit like uh, in your like family policy or something to handle stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I always tell people, if you have personal assets, put it in your family trust, right? So your home, that's a personal, um, you know, that's your primary residence. That's a personal asset. If you're putting in, um, you know, your insurance policies, I consider that, you know, personal, but you can have multiple policies. Somebody asked in the Facebook group, can you have multiple policies? Absolutely. You can have an unlimited amount of multi, uh, about, um, an unlimited amount of policies. So me, I only have one IUL policy, right? Marvin, I think he has six or seven policies. So now in my mind, I'm like, okay, it's time for me to get another policy, right? Because I want also an, a whole life policy. So now I'm going to do what you're about to do, Marquita. I'm going to get a whole life policy, but it's going to be owned by my business trust because I'm the key man. Okay. So I'm already in alignment with what you're talking about. I personally have my trust owns five policies, five IUL policies, one is under me, one is under a co-trustee, and then the other three IUL policies are for my three beneficiaries. So you can have multiple policies. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome, Marquita. Thank you for asking that good question. Next, we have Judith. Hey, Judith, how are you? Hi. This, we're the Ashleys. Me and my husband, is we're right here, and uh, we're oh, glad hey, to be and here. Oh, nice. What's your husband's name? Ainsley Ashley. A oh, Ainsley. Okay, I think I've seen that name. Yeah, Ainsley and Jud Judith Ashley. But um, I we have two questions. One of the okay. questions is, is um, do you have to pay taxes when you transfer your business into the trust? Do you, um, so do you have to pay taxes? Um. It depends on if you're going to um, if you're going to like register your transaction. Right. So if you're going to register your transaction, then, yes, you do have to pay taxes on you selling the actual uh, business. Um, but you can you um, actually you know, you don't have to register that transaction if you don't want to. So it's optional. Um, because what we're primarily doing is we're filling out the business purchase agreement for our record keeping in the event that something comes up to where um, to where, you know, they're trying to claim that you have some type of like ownership interest. Then you have records to show, hey, no, I don't. Right. So. It depends on you if you want to, but I personally just keep it private because your trust is private. And so your transactions are also private. So do you want to make that a public transaction? It's up to you. If you don't, I personally wouldn't. So if you don't, you just keep it private and, um, and keep that agreement private and keep it within your records. Okay, great. Sounds great. Also, um, one more question. As far as the universal policy goes, being that we're husband and wife, do, would we be able to get one policy for both of us or would it be, have to be two policies, one each? So um, is there one life or two lives? Two lives right now. Okay. You guys are individual. Was y'all born together or separate? Um, uh, separate. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, listen, I know you love him, okay? I know he loves you, but y'all two <laughs> separate individuals, you guys need your own policies, okay? It doesn't even make sense for you to do infinite banking with only one policy. You have to oh, insure yeah. everybody. So I'm pretty sure the way you're structuring your trust, the way that I hear y'all so in love, y'all both co-trustees. So you need to insure all of the trustees, okay? So insure um, everyone because wh what if you don't wake up tomorrow? Don't you want your husband and your family to be taken care of? Yes. So the yeah. insurance company is going to have to cut a check. And the same thing goes for on the other side with your husband. Let's go. Come on now. Let's okay. get two policies. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry. I'm just so extra. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. 
<laughs> oh my gosh, I cracked myself okay. up. Okay, Seven, how are you? Yeah, some of the questions were answered. So um, I'm trying to think, well, if I had one more on my notes right here. <clears throat> Thanks for coming back to me, by the way. You're so welcome. It's 1.30, you guys, so we are over by 31 minutes. Let me see. No, I'm good for now. Thank you so much anyway. You are so welcome. Well, if you guys have any questions, let me put my, um. let me see here on the chat. I'm going to put the link so that you could book a call with me. So once you guys are done uh, with filling out your um, your trust, then book a call with me so that I can, you know, be your second uh, set of eyes. And then you can go ahead and get it uh, notarized. So I'm here as a resource for you guys. So right now I'm going to put the link so that you guys could book a call some of you guys already have this. Um, and then let me see, let me go to the chat. Perfect. There's the link so that you guys can book a call. So once you're done setting up everything, book a call so that we could talk about your structure. We could talk about your specific, you know, um, trust and whatever else questions that you guys might have. So is there any other last questions? Cause if not, then I'm going to give you guys the homework. So is there any other last questions? Rashad said, thanks. Yeah. Um, is You're the so link to book a call, is that, can that be sent out in the email or is it already in the email? Oh, it is, it is. It All is? The links okay, great. Yeah, uh, everything's already in the email. So the link to book a call for Marvin's team, the link to book a call with me is in the email. My affiliate link for iPostal, if you guys are going to get virtual address, is also in the email um, and the Facebook group, right? You guys should be in the Facebook group. So the homework for tonight is, right, um, what... The homework for tonight is go inside of the Facebook group and, and post and let us know when you are going to um, actually start transferring your assets and when are you going to book a call with the insurance company so that you can actually have your IULs and your whole life be the first asset in your um, in your trust, right? So some of us on the call, we don't have assets. So the trust is gonna be the first asset, right? Some of us, we do have assets. So that house, that car, you know, that company, when are you going to transfer that into the trust, right? So that is um, the homework for tonight. And then the last thing is give us some feedback. Let us know what your experience was, you know, with the workshop and, and how everything went. So I actually want to see if um, if any of you guys will come on camera and let me know what your experience has been. So I know I heard from Andre. Um, I know I heard from Andre. And uh, who else did I hear from? Um, I know a few of you guys said something. So if you don't, oh, Solomon said something too. Thank you. So if you guys don't mind, if you have any feedback, if you have any, you know, nice things to say about the workshop, I would really, really, really appreciate it. Cause sometimes we, um, you know, use this just to let other people know, Hey, you know, this person, you know, Andre had a good experience here, you know, at the workshop and stuff. So if there's anybody who wants to come on camera, if there anybody who wants to say anything nice about their experience at the workshop, I would really appreciate it. So you could either uh, raise your hand, come off mute. I'll go ahead, Christina. Um, like when Thank we you. met, I told you I had just created um, a trust and paid a, a state planner and she did not educate me one third of what you did in these past five days. So I really appreciate it. It's life changing. And the fact that we can go back and watch the videos because, you know, we're multitasking and trying to still, you know, take care of other responsibilities while being present on the call is so helpful as well. So I just appreciate everything. Thank you so much, Katie. I really appreciate you saying those beautiful words. And that is exactly what, you know, what we're here for. Even Solomon said it, right? He's like, this is a uh, um, trust set up for dummies, right? So it's like, it, like the way that I teach is I break it down like so that a third grader can understand it because that's 
how my foundation is as an educator, right? Because I came from the nursing field. And so when I was a nurse, we couldn't use these big words and these, you know, this type of medical jargon with our patients. We had to break it down like they was in third grade so that they could understand their disease process and they could understand the medications and the side effects and the things that they were experiencing. So that's how I educate. And that is how I broke down this program so that anybody and everybody could really fully, thoroughly understand from A to Z how to become a trustee. So thank you so much, Katie, for saying those beautiful words. I really appreciate you. Um, you have just been such an amazing person. And I'm so glad that you took that leap of faith and joined the um, join the workshop and now you're part of the wealthy trustee program and I know that um, you are going to be pouring into the community because that's just what you're all about so Katie she does real estate so if you guys are in you know Atlanta are you only licensed in Georgia uh, Katie or somewhere else okay so if you guys are in Georgia which I know a lot of our trustees are um, you know reach out to Katie because she'll be able to help you and be a resource when it comes to real estate and then she is also in insurance now two guys okay so she's a part of um uh, marvin's team so definitely uh get inside of the facebook group so that you can network with the under other individuals that are inside of the community i'm telling you it's powerful um it's extremely powerful and i'm going to be working on us um having some meetups right so a bunch of us i want to say that was like what maybe 10 or 15 of us, we met up in Atlanta on uh, January 27th. And so now we're going to have another meetup coming up soon. So I'm going to let you guys know when the next meetup is so that we can get together, you know, in person, right? I know a lot of you guys are in Florida, but you guys are in other states. So right now we're thinking about Texas and we're also, th I'm also thinking about having something here in Miami. So um, I want us to, you know, be a tight knit community right now. There's like over 400 of us and there's like probably only half of that in the Facebook group. So the Facebook group has like 260 something people. So we are um, going to be, you know, working together and being a resource and just helping each other with this trustee journey, right? So thank you, Katie. Um, anybody else have anything to say about their experience in the workshop before we wrap it up? I do not bite you guys. <laughs> I do not buy. And if you don't want to come off of camera, that's understandable. So I just really do want your feedback. And I do want to know what your experience has been because we've been together literally for five days and for a total of, of 12 hours. So, or even more, probably close to 13 hours. So anybody else have anything to say about their experience uh, with the Wealthy Trustee Workshop? I'll say something. Thank you, Seven. Um, I think... Everything that we've experienced is, is is bar none the best thing I've heard as far as trusts and setting them up, business trust. These are phenomenal tools to change our life, basically. And, you know, I sent uh, some information on uh, some things about how things work. Just by what you're talking about brings back some uh, some ideas about the way things work, how Solomon was saying he was having an issue at the DMV and stuff like that, because we live in what we're learning is we're living two different worlds. And when we move into this world and this way of being is completely different from the standard world that most people live in. It's, it's kind of like bursting the bubble and, and having a new life. And I appreciate that coming from you, all the stuff that you teach, because it helps us to understand things. I see another side of it based on what you say, you say and what the actual way that people do things. And there's two different worlds that are so obvious because in one world, it's it's kind of a, um, the standard way of doing things, but they never tell you there's another world that's in parallel to it. It's almost like we're standing in front of a two-way mirror. And on the other side is the world that you're teaching, but no one can see you unless they find you. That is exactly what's happening here. And we're, we're having kind of a... a a rebirth. That's what this is. There's a lot of learning. I'm not saying I'm a pro. I'm learning as I go, but I know once, you know, I really get it, it's, the light's just going to completely go on. But that is, these are the things that, that really change lives. 
And that's what I totally appreciate about your intrinsic value. I mean, it's phenomenal. That's what I have to say about that. Because we live in two different worlds and we're finally seeing where it's at. And I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Seven. I appreciate that. And you're right. It is two different worlds, right? You got the private world and you got the public world, right? And so unfortunately, a lot of this information is not being you know, taught. It's not being passed down from generation to generation like it's supposed to. And so I empower you guys to teach you know, your future generations so that they don't get, you know, get lost, right? They need to know about- right the private world so that they could operate right. privately and be empowered. So thank you so much for, you know, bringing that to our attention because it's important. It's important. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was talking to another trustee and we were saying um, to each other how it's important to have like one foot in the public, right? Because right. you have benefits at when you're using your name and social and then one foot out to where you're in the private to where you have even more benefits of operating privately. So, right. yeah, right. Definitely. We're established. We're established in that standard world because by ignorance, I think is, is the way we've been taught. And just to ask you these trusts, just to verify this, and I believe this is what it is. The trusts are based on common law, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Yep. Common okay. law. That's, That's common it. law. Most people, well, from what I've learned, I, I, a lot of people that I talk to are, are clueless about common law. So common law is law of the land. But the system, the system operates on maritime admiralty law. That's law of the sea. That has nothing to do with the land. So the system that they're operating on is... It's kind of like by forced consent through ignorance because we and then when we try to convey like what Solomon was saying, they try to say, oh, I don't know nothing about that. Uh, we don't do that, uh, you know, because their lower level is never trained on the upper level of what's really going on. Like sometimes you can, you know, you could talk to a police officer. He's clueless. But then when you talk to his uh, officer in command, he'd be like, oh, yeah, you know what? That's they know what they're talking about. That's it. So it's a different world in all these things. So the maritime admiralty law, law is what I learned that most things, almost everything function in that capacity. That's the general mainstream nature. So now that we're operating in common law, we're operating outside that bubble. So like you said, you can kind of converge both ways, whatever benefits you per se. And these things, uh, what I learned about the, the our identities, our identities aren't even true. Like our driver's license, all caps name, anything we get in the mail, all caps name. That's not us. It's what I'm learning. So yeah, that's you know, a this, dead entity. Yeah, that's a dead entity. It is not us. Our driver's license, people say, hey, let me see your driver's license. Is that you? And you go, uh, yeah, that's me. No, it's not. That's not you because you are a flesh and blood entity now that we're talking to you operating in common law. You see what I'm saying? So that flesh and blood entity can only be one person, the one that has the soul. That's yeah. us. That's how we're operating now. Thank you for bringing this to our attention because the other world, it sucks. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> Thank you so much, Seven. Thank you for everyone who, you know, who took that leap of faith, who decided to, um, you know, go through this workshop and actually take action on the information that was taught throughout this uh, workshop. Oh, Rashad has something to say. So thank you guys so, so, so much. Rashad? Yep, I was going to chime in. Um, the workshop has been fantastic. It's very, very organized, which I like about it a lot. And it's really an investment. I mean, if you think about it, the taxes that you can save off of doing one of those trusts will pay for the class 10, five times over in one year, every year. So it's, it's, an, it's a no brainer coming to the class. I really enjoy myself and you're doing, doing a great job. 
Thank you so much, Rashad. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's so true, right? Like a lot of us, we don't even think about implementing things within our, you know, financial situation so that we could reduce our taxes. We just think, oh, well, the IRS already took, you know, whatever's entitled to them. And that's just how life is. No, there are certain things that you can do. There's certain accounts that you can get. There's certain ways that you can, you know, funnel your money so that you can reduce your taxes and build wealth with what you're saving, right? Just imagine that. So thank you so much, Rashad, for showing up every single day, for participating, for asking all these valuable questions. You have been asking questions that people didn't even think they wanted to know, right? So thank you so much for now being a part of the community, right? Because you're going to add value to the community. I appreciate every single person on this call and just know that I am a resource for you, okay? So you have my number, right? You have my number. You just call me if you have any questions. You text the community line. You um, post on Facebook. You have my email. You email me. I'm going to email you right back, right? So whatever questions that you need, um, I am here um, to answer them. And I'm here as a resource for you guys. And you have lifetime access to the workshop. So when we do the workshop next month in March, you can come here and participate and you can actually sit in and retain the information. That's what I tell a lot of trustees. It's like, keep showing up to the workshops because now you're going to retain the information because it's repetitive because you've already heard it before. So and a lot of us like Nancy, I've seen her. Right. Nancy has been to a couple of workshops. Ronnie has been to a couple of of uh, workshops. Uh, who else? Um, Mashan, he's been to a couple of workshops. So there's a, oh, Allison. Oh my God. Allison is a VIP. So, um, she's been to workshops and she, uh, she comes to the, um, the webinars, right? Because of retention, she's always learning new information and she's been operating as a trustee for a couple months now. So, like I said, you guys, it was an absolute pleasure spending the last 14 hours with you guys, right? And um, and so don't forget the homework. Go ahead and post in the Facebook group. Um, give us a testimonial. Let us know, uh, you know, what feedback, what what do you think that, you know, if we need to make any changes or how you felt about the workshop, post it in the Facebook group and then do your homework, right? So let us know when you're going to transfer your assets as well as when you're going to book that call with Marvin's team so that you guys can... Um, um, inquire about your IUL policy and your whole life policy. So with that being said, I am closing up the workshop, you guys. Okay. So Dana is our program director. You're going to hear from her. She's here to hold you guys accountable to make sure that those trusts, one, get set up, two, get notarized. You start opening up bank accounts and you start transferring assets and operating as a trustee. Okay. So you are going to be hearing from Dana, um, you know, within the next couple of days, um, because that is your new accountability partner, you guys. Okay. So use her as a resource as well. Her email is support at seven ways to wealth.com. And she is also, um, you know, very active in the Facebook community as well. Both of us are. So with that being said, thank you guys. You guys have an amazing Friday, an amazing weekend. And then we do have a Q and A every other week. So our next Q and A is going to be March 5th at um, 6 p.m. Okay. So if you have any questions, hop into the Zoom and ask your questions. Okay. So I will see you guys soon. Thank you so much. God bless you guys. Bye. God bless you too. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.